Gabon. In light of the current situation in Zimbabwe, I would like to set the record straight about the situation in the Zimbabwean prisons and the welfare of prisoners based on my personal experience. My name is Super M. I joined the Zimbabwe prison service as a technical person in the medical field and was employed as a prison medic. I did my military training and attended a Bazinduna training camp in Matebeleland. I was stationed at Mutare prison in Manikaland region and was coordinating seven prisons which fell under Manikaland region, namely Mutare Riman prison, Mutare farm prison, Nyanga prison, Chipinge prison, Rusape prison, Marondera prison, and Chivu prison. There are five classes of prisoners in Zimbabwean prisons. The remand prisoners, the A class, the B class, the C class, and the D class. Each prison has a dispensing clinic for the prisoners and clinic for prison officers and their families. It was my responsibility to facilitate and to coordinate health, hygiene, and welfare of prisoners in the region. Each prison had one nurse, a TB coordinator, and a B-class prisoner who was responsible for cleaning and maintaining order in the clinic. The dispensing clinics inside the jails are not clinics per se, but small rooms with a desk, a cupboard to store medicines, one examination bed, and some chairs. There was no privacy when consulting or treating sick inmates due to shortage of space. There were many challenges and obstacles that we encountered as dispen when dispensing our duties as the medical team. Many prisoners were suffocating to death due to overcrowding and poor ventilation in the cells. Many cells had no windows but small air vents which were too small to supply enough oxygen into the cells. Due to shortage of space and cells, it was very difficult to either isolate or quarantine inmates with com communicable or contagious diseases, especially tuberculosis, scabies, and influenza. There was a severe shortage of food for the prisoners leading to severe malnourishment and emaciation of inmates. Prisoners were so malnourished and emaciated to the extent that one would think that they were real life characters of the movie, Walking Dead. Some of the prisoners were so thin and wasted to an extent of doing a chest x-ray with your own eyes because all that you could see was a skin covering a skeleton. There was a critical shortage of uniforms, blankets, and medicines for the inmates. Daily mortality rate was ever increasing, mainly due to malnutrition, suffocation, and diseases. The cells were dirty and stinking because the toilets do not flush from inside the cells. The cells were not fumigated regularly, so fleas and lice would feast on inmates with impunity. Blankets were dirty and filthy. One would not dare cover his head. Prisoners' uniforms were torn and tattered to cover the essentials. In winter, prisoners were given jerseys only when they were going to attend court. There was no running water or electricity. No beds were in the cells, so prisoners made floor beds. Pigs and dogs live better lives than prisoners in Zimbabwe, and the jails are not su suitable for human beings. Despite all those hardships the inmates were subjected to, the prison officers were entitled to beat the daylight out of them with their button sticks for any mistake that, that they could have made. The majority of prisoners in Zimbabwe are the B-class prisoners, those who are serving jail terms below 10 years. They are the ones who pay the price of being incarcerated. 
They are forced to work on the farms as general laborers. The prison farms in Zimbabwe are a replica of hell and holocaust combined together. Daily routine gangs go out to work in groups of 10, 15, or 20, with the prison guards escorting them carrying Mossberg or AK-47 assault rifles and police dogs. They cultivate hundreds of acres and hectares of maize fields on the prison farm. Even tractors and combined harvesters might not raise such clouds of dust as they tilt the land. Zimbabwean prisons are not for the weak or the sick. As the earth bleeds, many would cough out blood and others would collapse with pain and agony. One would mistakenly think they were prisoners of war alien to Zimbabwe. There were several gangs for different functions and duties. The firewood gang, the kitchen gang, the dairy gang, the laundry gang, the officer's compound cleaning gang, the piggery gang, the mortuary gang to pick dead bodies from cells and load onto trucks. The list was endless. In Zimbabwe, the government has the right to bury a prisoner as a pauper, with or without informing his family or beloved ones about his or her demise. The bulk of the farm produce, mainly fresh milk, eggs, beef, pork, and vegetables, never benefited the prisoners themselves. The majority of the farm produce found its way into the homes of prison officers and those in positions of authority. Honestly, if what they produced was used to feed the poor prisoners, they would have not died from malnutrition or starvation. In some of the prisons, Inmates were trading rice and rodents, which they gave to the kitchen gang to grill for them in order to gain a few calories and protein. As if hard labor, starvation, overcrowding and disease were not punishment enough, there was a circular which was circulated to all prisons, which allowed those in the highest echelons of power to hire prisoners to work on their private properties. The circular allowed the officers in charge of prisons to outsource inmates to senior government officials from, from Department of Justice, Army, Police, and others who were politically connected. The move was designed to allow senior government officials who had recently acquired farms to get cheap labor from prisoners. The new farmers would build holding cells on their farms like dungeons to put prisoners. The new farmers would build dungeons like the ones used by slave traders on the coastal shores of Ghana. Nigeria and Cameroon during slave trade to hold slaves while waiting for the ships and buyers to arrive. I wrote a letter to the Commissioner of Prisons, Mr. Parazai Zimondi, condemning the secular with all the conduct that it deserved. In my letter, I emphasized on the danger such a move would cause on the welfare of prisoners in Zimbabwe. Outsourcing of prisoners to senior police officers would mean more arrests were going to be made and magistrates would also make sure Sorry. more convictions were done in order to get cheap labor. Jails which were already overcrowded would then become overwhelmed. There was no legal aid in Zimbabwe, and a few human rights lawyers available would only assist a few prominent political activists. About 80% of convicted inmates could have been found not guilty if they had legal representation during trial. My name also appeared in the Sunday Mail newspaper as one of the beneficiaries of the A2 farms in Chinoy area of Mashonan and West Province. After visiting the farm on two occasions, I later declined to sign the offer letter for accepting the farm. 
the manner in which the farms were acquired was not only brutal and unlawful, but was also violent, aggressive, and barbaric. I told myself I would rather die poor than to be rich from proceeds and benefits of theft and looting. That act did not go down well with some of the prison authorities in Manikaland, and I was labeled an enemy of the state. And my actions were seen as subversive and non-patriotic. They started victimizing me, and at one stage they accused me of being friendly to prisoners and overprotecting them. I was also accused for influencing prisoners to stage a prison revolt to protest against the outsourcing of prisoners to the new farmers. To allow the dust to settle, I applied for a long vacation leave with the aim to open my own private clinic before resigning from the prison cell. My leave was urgently granted since my absence was a blessing to them. I managed to open my own clinic at Muramida Growth Point, a few kilometers from Tari. I got an overwhelming support from the community and the clinic started flourishing. One morning before starting work, my clinic was surrounded by members of the police and the, the prison military police and I was arrested. They vandalized my clinic, took all the medicines, medical records for the patients and some medical and surgical utensils. They told me they were going to do an audit and check if the batch numbers were not corresponding with the ones at the prison. They left all the other larger items like medical examination beds and furniture. They took me to Muramida police station where I was locked up for five days and five nights without a charge. I was left under the custody of the officer in charge, Inspector Marasira, and his second in charge, Sergeant Rodin. After five days, they took me to Mtare Police Station, where I stayed another three days before I was taken to court for a formal bail hearing. I was represented by Advocate Maweni on my bail application, but there is one thing that I remember vividly that happened on that day. After several delays to hear the case, a senior magistrate who was presiding over my case complained to the prosecutor that he was not happy about the interference of prison authorities in my case. He clearly stated that he had received a call from the commander of prisons in Manikaland region, Assistant Commissioner Jisora, instructing him to deny me bail. The magistrate was level-headed and he granted me bail anyway. During trial, I hired one of the most prominent and celebrated lawyers in Manikaland, Advocate Victor Mazengero of Mazengero Gaza and Associates to represent me. If I remember well on his heads of argument, he was dwelling on unlawful arrest, lack of evidence, politically motivated arrest, and he wanted the case to be thrown away with court. He vehemently argued with the presiding magistrate and the prosecutor until the regional prosecutor came in person and told the magistrate there were no basis upon which the state was going to continue with the case. He categorically stated that there was no evidence and the people who arrested me had no right whatsoever to do so. My case was withdrawn before plea. The court also ordered the prison authorities to return the medicine, the medical records that they took from the clinic, but they never returned them. Even me, I was not going to trust using those medicines on my patients since they could have been tampered with. The action by the prison authorities proved to me that they were a law unto themselves could defy court orders at will, 
and do not observe the rule of law. Besides holding prisoners and offenders, jails in Zimbabwe are used for many other functions. Prisons in Zimbabwe are used as a weapon of mass oppression and suppression. Jail is used to instill fear and to weaken people's spirit. In Zimbabwe, there are more jails than technical colleges and universities combined in each region. In a country of less than 15 million people, with one third of its population either in exile or in diaspora, Zimbabwe has more than 50 prisons and less than 10 universities. It is a public secret how prisoners in Zimbabwe are subjected to abuse. Even Jews at Sobibo concentration camp in Germany during World War lived a more dignified manner and were well fed though condemned to death. I was arrested because I refused to be bribed with a stolen farm. I was arrested because I denied them an opportunity to use prisoners as slaves on their farms. They arrested me in order to send a clear message to others who would dare stand as impediments in their wicked and evil ways. I could have taken the farm, yes, but at the expense of poor and vulnerable prisoners. I could have been captured like many others who were given farms and cash loans from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. The government in Zimbabwe is hiding behind the mantle of lockdown regulations and the spread of COVID-19 in order to unleash gross human rights abuses on its citizens. Opo Chingono, Jacob Ngarivumi, Job Sikala, and many other activists are a clear testimony of the crisis in Zimbabwe, which needs an urgent solution to permanently eradicate it. We advocate for some of the jails in Zimbabwe to be closed or converted into technical colleges or COVID hospitals or isolation centers. We call upon the United Nations to intervene because the SADC and the AU have failed us this money. Their voice may mold type of approach to the Zimbabwean crisis is no longer working. We call upon the United Nations to hold Zimbabwe to account and to respect the basic fundamental rights of the people as stipulated in the Freedom Charter. After several threats and attempts to my life, including a moving vehicle accident, I decided to run away from Zimbabwe and sought refuge in South Africa. I went far and further from the Zimbabwean border to seek asylum. At Cape Town Refugee Reception Center, there were many people and the majority of African countries were fairly represented. It seems as if Africa was in a world war and the situation at the center was chaotic. I slept outside the home affairs buildings for almost one week without any hope of getting assistance. Even pregnant women were giving birth outside the home affairs offices. I met two guys. Uh, one was from the Democratic Republic of Congo and the other one was from Burundi. They were also narrating their horrible stories about serious atro atrocities in their own countries and how they managed to escape from the jaws of brutality perpetrated by mankind. After some days discussing, I got to realize that the reason why people were full at the reception center was because the asylum papers were being sold. One had to cough out a thousand rand cash in order to get a paper. There were some agents from different countries who were working with the home affairs in officials inside the building who were soliciting for bribes. After paying the required amount, the agent would then text or SMS the person's details and country of origin. 
when the number reaches 50 or 60, one of the home affairs officials will then come out and call out names. The same could happen at every one or two hour intervals. I managed to get the phone numbers for two of the agents and I convinced the guys I was friendly to to escort me to the offices of the Director General of Immigration which was along Barack Street in Cape Town. At the Director General's office we demanded to see the Director and after several interrogations since we had no formal appointment with him we were told he was engaged in a meeting but he assigned his deputy to meet with us. After narrating and explaining our story and informing them about the corrupt activities taking place at the reception center, a sting operation was put in place. It was very said that the home affairs officials were juxtaposing money and corruption over desperation and misery. I managed to get my asylum papers after the intervention of the Director General of Immigration in Cape Town. At the hearing of the determination of my status, one of the Home Affairs officials told me that there is no Zimbabwean who is entitled to get refugee status in South Africa, no matter how strong he is or a case may be, and it was a directive from the top. He said all Zimbabweans are considered economic migrants. A lawyer who was representing me, Advocate Nkushu, was not allowed to enter the Home Affairs offices. Although they still renew my papers, I'm still waiting for the determination and finalization of my status. The delay has adversely affected me in so many ways since I cannot register with the Health Professions Council to practice as a medical professional. We saw sanity in the department when Dr. Mbosaza Nasamini Zuma was appointed as Minister of Home Affairs. She made many positive changes and she was a panacea to our problem. We also thank President Cyril Ramaphosa for the continued support and upholding of the spirit of Ubuntu. As foreign nationals or refugees the world over, we are sometimes caught between a rock and a hard surface. Sometimes God can set you to lose all that you had worked for, including your own dignity, in order to save other people's lives. God can make you speak on behalf of those who are still under the chains of slavery and oppression. The Almighty can set you to speak on behalf of all those prisoners in Zimbabwe who are eating maggots from their septic wounds of slavery in order to survive. We shall keep on fighting for peace, justice and equal opportunities for all mankind. I thank you. Aluta continua. Asante sana.